So we also have indicators of stress. So it can we could have physiological indicators. We have psychological indicators. We also have cognitive indicators. Okay. For your physiological indicators, the physiological signs and symptoms of stress result from the acti activation of sympathetic and neuroendocrine system of the body. So we can tell if the person is under stress if we could notice some physiological indicators. For example, he breathes rapidly. Okay, That could be an indicator that he is stressed. Also, increased heart rate. Okay, So these are the responses made by your sympathetic nervous system response and your neuroendocrine systems of your body. So that's your physiological indicators. We also have your psychological indicators. So we have anxiety, fear, anger, depression, and unconscious ego mechanisms. Okay. So for your anxiety, it is a common reaction to stress. It is a state of mental uneasiness, apprehension, dread, or foreboding, or a feeling of helplessness related to an impending or anticipated unidentified threat to self and significant relationships. Okay, so that is your anxiety. It is a common reaction to stress. So we have four levels of your anxiety. We have your mild anxiety, moderate anxiety, severe anxiety, and last, your panic anxiety, your panic. Okay. So for your mild anxiety, produces slight arousal that enhances perception, learning, and productive abilities. So this should be maintained. This uh, level of anxiety should be achieved and maintained in cases that you need to focus on a particular task, for example, during examinations, okay? We must maintain or we should have a mild anxiety level so that we could have a, so that it could enhance our perception, our learning, and productive abilities, okay? So that means when we say mild anxiety, it is, uh, it should be maintained and attained by us in case that we in case in cases where we need to focus on some task or activities moderate anxiety so increases the arousal to a point where the person expresses feeling of tension nervousness or concern so the perceptual abilities are narrowed or are decreased here Okay. So we also have your severe anxiety. Okay? It consumes most of the person's energies and requires intervention. Okay? So in this level of anxiety, nurses need to intervene. Okay? Nurses need to do something for the patient okay? with this level of anxiety. So perception is further decreased and the patient is unable to focus on what is really happening, okay? So that's your severe anxiety. For your panic, so an overpowering, frightening level of anxiety causing the person to lose control. This is where your patient loses his or her control, okay? To things or to his body, okay? So less frequently experienced than the other levels of anxiety okay so as a nurse our goal is to is to avoid okay this level of anxiety okay as much as possible we need to maintain the level of anxiety of our patient in mild anxiety level okay because that is a that is considered as a positive level of anxiety Okay, so that's it. So we have four levels of anxiety. We have your mild, moderate, severe, and the panic. Okay, so what is fear? 
fear and emotion or feeling of apprehension aroused by impending or seeming danger, pain, or another perceived threat. Okay. So anxiety and, and, and fear differ in four ways. So the source of anxiety may not be identified. However, the source of fear is identified. Anxiety is related to the future, that is, to an anticipated event. Fear, on the other hand, is related to the past, present, and future. Anxiety is vague, whereas fear is definite. Fourth, anxiety results from psychological or emotional conflict. Fear results from a specific physical and psychological entity. Okay, so these are the four ways of why anxiety and fear uh, differ. Okay. So we have anger, okay? an emotional state consisting of a subjective feeling or animosity or strong displeasure. Okay? So that's your anger. It's an emotional state. Okay? We also have your depression. It is a common reaction to events that seem overwhelming or negative. So an extreme feeling of sadness, despair, dejection, lack of worth, or emptiness. So it's more of a, an overwhelming and a negative feeling. Okay, There's an extreme feeling of sadness. So your, your ego defense mechanisms. So this is unconscious psychological adaptive mechanisms or mental mechanisms that develop as the personality attempts to defend itself, establish, com uh, establish compromises among conflict impulses, and calm inner tensions. So we use uh, ego defense mechanisms as a way to defend ourselves, okay, from uh, stress or from tensions, okay. So we have a lot of ego defense mechanisms, and these are somehow helpful for us uh, in dealing with uh, stress, okay? Now, let's proceed to your cognitive indicators. So, we have your problem-solving, structuring, self-control, self-discipline, and suppression, okay? And lastly, we have your fantasy, okay? So, once we uh, observe that your patient is using these cognitive indicators, we can say that that particular person is experiencing stress. Okay? So for your problem solving, involves thinking through the threatening situation using specific steps to arrive at a solution. So obviously, when we say problem solving, it's about prob uh, solving a particular problem. Okay? So that's one way of resolving stress of a person. We also have your structuring. It is the arrangement or manipulation of a situation so threatening events do not occur. Okay, So this is where you uh, modify or you manipulate, you change the situation so that a, a threatening events or a particular stress will not occur. We also have self-control or discipline. So assuming a manner and facial expression that convey a sense of being in control or in change. Okay, self-control can be said also as discipline. Okay, so also we have your suppression. Okay, consciously and willfully putting a thought or feeling out of mind. Example, statement like, I won't deal with that today. I won't deal with that today. I'll do it tomorrow. So it's a conscious and willfully. So you have an intention to suppress that feeling and thoughts out of your mind. We also have your fantasy or daydreaming to make believe 
unfulfilled wishes and desires are imagined as fulfilled or threatening experiences is reworked or replayed so it ends differently from the reality okay so basically we are making ourselves believe okay that we have fulfilled something okay we want an uh, we dream okay we dream that uh, we dream of the things that we want to happen okay for a particular situation and that way we will be able to uh, avoid okay of able to avoid such threatening experiences okay so that's your fantasy or your daydreaming okay now let's proceed to coping so it is a cognitive and behavioral effort to manage specific external and or internal demands that are appraised as taxing or exceeding the sor the resources of the person okay so we use coping to manage uh, to manage the stress that we are experiencing or the demands that we are uh, that we uh, are experiencing so we also have here coping strategy and coping mechanism it is a natural or learned way of responding to a changing environment or specific problems or situations so these are mainly strategies or ways on how we deal with the problem or the stress so we have two types of coping strategy we have your problem focused and we have your emotion focused in your problem focused coping it refers to the efforts to improve a situation by making changes or taking actions so here we manage stress by way of taking an action okay by way of uh, making each changes okay in order to solve or improve the situation okay or the problem in your emotion focused coping it includes it includes thoughts and actions that relieve emotional distress okay does not improve the situation but the person often feels better okay so in this type of emo uh, coping your emotion focus coping the main purpose of this is to is to make the person feel better okay but it does not uh, it does not focus or it does or its intention is not to improve or change the situation at hand okay so it's more of the thoughts and the action that relieve the emotional distress of the person experiencing problem or stress we also have long and short-term coping strategies for your long-term coping strategies it can be constructive and practical so example is your lifetime uh, lifestyle patterns okay so you have to change your lifestyle okay and that would take a long-term process okay that is why we call it long-term coping strategies or mechanisms we also have your short-term coping strategies can reduce stress to a tolerable limit temporarily temporarily but are ineffective ways to permanently deal with reality okay so it means it takes only short uh, period of time okay may have a destructive or detrimental effects on the person okay so that's the difference between your long-term coping strategies and your short-term coping strategies we also have adaptive and maladaptive coping okay so when we say adaptive coping it helps the person to deal effectively with stressful events and minimizes the stress associated with them so it can also be said as effective coping so adaptive coping is effective coping maladaptive coping so it can cause unnecessary distress for the person and other associated with the person or stressful events 
and it is also called as ineffective coping. So, maladaptive coping simply means ineffective coping. Okay, so that's the difference between your adaptive and maladaptive coping. We also have here caregiver burden. Okay, what is caregiver burden? It is the reaction to long-term stress seen in a family member or members who undertake the care of a person in the home for a long-term period. Okay, it produces responses such as chronic fatigue, sleeping, difficulties, and high blood pressure. Okay, so this means that the person who cares for a family member, for example, in, in the home for a long period of time, could actually experience burden, okay? okay? This is a burden of taking care of that person at home for a long-term period. Okay, that's your caregiver burden. How about uh, your crisis? So it is an acute time-limited state of disequilibrium resulting from situational, developmental, or societal sources of stress, okay? A person in crisis is temporarily unable to cope with or adapt to the stressor by using previous methods of problem solving, okay? So this is where, if the, uh, this is where a person uses his or her uh, methods of solving the problem, based on the pre uh, based on uh, the exper based on the experiences of uh, a previous situation however in your crisis these uh, these previous methods of problem solving are not effective in solving the current problem so if that happens crisis will take place Okay, so that is your crisis. Crisis intervention. It is a process that includes not only the client in crisis, but also various members of the client support network. It is a short-term helping process of assisting clients to work through a crisis to its resolution and restore their pre-crisis level of functioning. Okay. So that is your crisis intervention, okay? So what is burnout? It is a complex syndrome of behaviors that can be likened to the exhaustion stage of, a gen of the general adaptation syndrome, okay? So when you have exhausted all your energies, your efforts, your defense mechanisms, and these things won't work, Okay, so you will experience burnout. Okay, so that's the definition of your burnout. So I believe I believe this is the last slide on our discussion regarding stress and coping. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned something today.